Good afternoon. I have the challenge of keeping you all awake and enlivening you after the lunch break, and I hope you had a good lunch. Let me first start by saying to the very impressive members of the uh, Al Shark Youth Forum, to the honorable guests, to the participants, and to those present here today, thank you for the opportunity of enabling me to speak to you today. I hope I will both challenge and also challenge some assumptions. In this era of fake news, let me start with two facts. Number one, everyone has a right to be informed with reliable and with impartial information. Second, everyone, no matter who or where they are, has a right to have a voice, has a right to be heard. Now, those are two pretty obvious statements, no? Well, today I'm going to argue that because of the state of modern media, these two fundamental freedoms risk dying out. And without immediate action by journalists and by media companies to remedy this, these critical rights for people right around the globe may be extinguished altogether. I was invited to speak today about the clutter of the media. This, in my view, is not clutter. This is not a perfect storm of converging bad fortune. This is willful, sometimes intentional, chaos created by politicians, by corporations, by individuals, and, I will argue, sometimes by the media themselves. And I'm going to argue that an industry that is meant to inform people is now, sometimes knowingly, steering its readers, its listeners, and its viewers off course. The time has come for the media and its consumers, you lot and everybody out there, to understand that we're part of the problem. If they don't, leaders in all corners of the globe will have a free-for-all to attack media, to try to shut them down, and the journalistic mission to inform risks being destroyed forever. And who will be the losers? Populations, people right around the globe, people crying out for reliable information. And who will be the victims? Well, those people at the center of events, people in the shadows, people with no voice who need to and have a right to have their stories heard. So we're looking to the future, and to understand where media is going, or perhaps needs to go, we need to understand today and how we got here. So let's paint a picture, a bit of context, briefly, of how we got here today, because I think it's important when we look to the future. It wasn't that long ago that journalism was seen as a craft by its consumers. It was a responsibility that most media were proud to uphold. Journalism was synonymous with the service of high-quality, reliable information. The job was to inform, to provide a vital oxygen of fundamental freedom. And trust from the consumer and people out there ensued. And about three decades ago, similar sort of time to when I started in the industry, there were just a few media outlets that existed, and most lived up to this expectation. Many of them partnered with the people in the pursuit of truth and were dogged and determined in, in finding facts and uncovering fiction. These institutions of journalism were trusted. They were respected by their readers and they were feared by those that were being challenged. They provided, provided a critical check and balance to the powerful. They lived up to the label dating back to 1787 and then recoined in the United States in the 1960s of the Fourth Estate, holding to account the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. And about 30 years ago, the business of information age began. The tycoons took over from the trusts and benefactors of the past, commercialization took hold, and the so-called news outlets proliferated. Just look at this amazing country. Look at Turkey. There are over 3,000 newspapers in Turkey and hundreds of TV stations. And right around the world, this same change was taking place. Providing information became a modern-era gold rush. In the pursuit of profit, 
Ratings and readers became the new mission. Many institutions that were founded in order to inform pivoted swiftly with a new mission to sell papers and maximize clicks for maximum revenue. If the front cover won't sell the ad on the inside front cover, it is no longer front page news. A statement by an editor in the 1970s, which I think is very, very relevant today. Cable news then emerged and it vied for viewers. Websites then emerged and they jostled for readers with newspapers. Niche markets emerged with new opportunities to make money. Market research identified lucrative demographics and the news agenda swung right and left. Impartiality for so many flew almost unnoticed out of the window. And then as we welcomed the new millennium, came the digital revolution. Information arrived on new platforms, on our laptops, on our mobiles, and on third parties, Twitter and Facebook and the others. Amid this sea of information, good journalism was becoming indistinguishable from the rest. Digital democratized information, of course, but it also muddied the definition of news. Trust waned. Citizen journalism and user-generated content became the new media and sharing and recommendations from friends became a validator of what was worth consuming. Journalism started drowning. And to complete the perfect storm, into this maelstrom, into this mix, stepped two powerful forces, politicians and PR professionals, who spotted and seized an opportunity. And they realized two things. By engaging directly with people, they can bypass the fourth estate altogether. And by doing so, their narrative can counter the real story. Then, call out the truth as a lie, if that's what you want to do, and your spin becomes even more plausible. Good journalism has been hijacked by those with the narrative they want told. Just think about the two labels, fake news and alternative facts, all too often used everywhere around the world today. And then politicians repeated assertions that experts and media can no longer be trusted. Marie Le Pen, Boris Johnson back in the UK, we all know about Donald Trump, even unsung Su Chi, to name but a few. They've all joined the ranks of media manipulators with one bond that unifies them. They massage the truth in pursuit of political gain. And as a powerful belittle the truth, by trying to cast doubt on everyone, perhaps, but themselves, we, the readers, the watchers, and the listeners, are none the wiser. Damn the fourth estate. Information is power, and we, arguably, are the powerless. Unbeknownst to us, we might be being spun into submission. I paint a very bleak picture, I know. But is there a solution to all of this? Well, I am an optimist, and I believe there is. And I believe now is the time for that solution, and we've reached that turning point. People like you and I and everyone out there in Turkey and beyond, they're a central part of the solution. The key is to let people know if they are the victims of untruth. Consumers are not stupid. No one tolerates being lied to so long as they know they are. And that's where the responsibility lies first with the media themselves. People have to know who they can trust and who is informing them properly. Then, and only then, can they start to hold politicians and the powerful to account. And right now, trust is at an all-time low. These figures are from the USA last year, but they're replicated in many, many countries right around the globe. Only six 6% of people say they trust the media. And two-thirds of the population say they actually believe mainstream media really publish fake news. So journalists need to look in the mirror and take responsibility for what they do. But this will only succeed if they recognize what's going on and make attempts to remedy it. Most journalists join the profession with a mission to inform and to be trusted. And they understand that their trade is being hijacked sometimes 
by politicians, the powerful, and PR professionals, and that this has actually sometimes been supported by some big media owners out there. Most journalists believe they exist to represent the people they cover and the people that they inform. So the time has come for both to work together to ensure integrity remains intact. Media has been bundled into one big pot. The narrative, this narrative, is one reason why it's less trusted now than at any time before. As a result, governments are emboldened not only to dismiss, but to attack and threaten all media for their own benefit. The fake news drum is being beaten louder and louder by politicians for their own gain. It's also being used to discredit any and all news providers, no matter who they are. And therein lies a problem. This narrative and challenge is beginning to have an impact everywhere. And if they're allowed to get away with it, the consequences will be dire. The climate means journalists must be even more committed, even more diligent, even more resolute. The fake news narrative must not make journalists and media companies defensive. It must make them stronger. It cannot make a media attack back, as seems to be happening in the United States right now with everything that's going on with Trump. It requires media to be even more impartial, even more resolute to uphold integrity. Reporters can't have agendas. They can't lose balance. And if they do, they should be stripped of the label journalist and join the world of alternative facts. So how can this be done? Well, I'd like to propose five steps that can and need to be taken, and need to be taken now. First, journalists need to take full responsibility for everything they report. They need to uphold the standards that people who need to trust them expect of them. Media are no one's spokesperson and no one's mouthpiece right the way down to the use of words. They must be impartial and unwavering, and they must be resolute. Just think of the label, War on Terror. It's a politician's label. Don't use it without attribution. Illegal immigrant, migrant, alien, to describe the people coming over the borders, so many of them into, into this country. Those labels are political narratives designed for someone else's ends. Whose narrative is right? Well, not theirs. These are people. Call them people, call them refugees, name them, and give them the humanity they deserve. Do not use the political labels that follow other people's agendas. Second, media need to watch the news agenda with great care. Not follow the rest, not follow the consensus of journalism that by and large covers four or five stories a day, and perhaps the net neglects so much of the rest. Act with integrity. Cover stories that are real stories. Less of Prince Harry back in my home country and Kim Kardashian, or whoever the modern equivalent of Kim Kardashian may be. More on real stories that matter. And that doesn't mean they have to be negative news. There are celebrations of humanity and there are celebrations of humankind that are powerful stories that deserve to be, to be told. Less wall-to-wall -to -wall Trump following more on the consequences of his actions. And it's not just what the media reports that matters, it's just as important what they don't report. Perhaps the greatest power media has is actually the power to ignore. Third, call it out when you get it wrong. Call it and call it with the same weight as the original story. Right now, in media right across the world, the correction doesn't get the same weight as the original story. It doesn't get the same attention as the error. Just read the tabloids. You'll see the scandal, but you'll miss the correction. And that destroys trust. Mistakes used to be the exception to the rule. Now they're seen as a byproduct of a busy 24-hour cycle. Well, that is nonsense. The consumer doesn't care who's first. They don't care about internal industry competitiveness and navel-gazing. They want to be informed. And mistakes, or uncorrected mistakes, are no better to them than misinformation. And we, consumers, should no longer tolerate it. Fourth, because of the current challenges, 
journalists must be more diligent and more determined. Spin and special interests will employ every tactic they can as they craft their narrative, especially when they're threatened by good journalism. So the media need to cut through this challenge and do their jobs with resolve. And this next one should be so obvious. Never let lazy journalism mistakenly let someone else's narrative reach their readers. A press release turned around without good journalism is no more than propaganda. It's so basic. Yet open the paper here today and in any other country in the world today, and you'll see it on every page. Fifth and finally, media need to clarify the line between opinion and fact, a line which is totally blurred right now. Of course, include others' opinions and be trans transparent and upfront about it, the opinion section of, of the website, or declare it as opinion. But there's no place for opinion in straight news reports, and there's no place for editorializing. And if you do, you should be called out for it and no longer deserve anyone's trust. So will the media do this for themselves? No, that's highly unlikely. Will politicians make them? Oh no, oh no, that's not in their interests at all. But we, they're consumers. We, their source of clicks, and therefore their source of revenue. We can, and we should call them out now. And now is the time to do so. We need a gold standard of journalism. So consumers can decide who meets it. People will embrace the opportunity to hold information providers to account, and good journalists will relish the opportunity to uphold their responsibilities and to be held to account. So a line needs to be drawn between those institutions that are committed to providing reliable information and those that are no more than purveyors of opinion and entertainment or providers of spurious stories devoid of substance or fact. There are still lots of media organizations out there that uphold the higher standards. In my home country now, the BBC and ITN, the New York Times in America, The Guardian, and of course my old baby, Al Jazeera English, and the sister channels of Al Jazeera Media Network. But don't also forget the buzzes of the world, the bloggers, and those citizen journalists out there who are doing a tremendous job too. Individuals and companies that are courageous and getting as close to the truth as they possibly can. Journalists who operate with impartiality and integrity at all times. People and organizations committed to storytelling and to balanced journalism. To finding and covering stories that need and deserve to be heard. Individuals and organizations that are pro-nothing and anti-nothing, who take no sides, who are no one's messenger or spokesperson and whose reputation, now and in the future, hang off the integrity with which they carry out their jobs. We need to recognize those individuals and those institutions for what they are. To hold those organizations to account, they should know. If they ever stray from that mission, the viewers, readers, and listeners will and should switch them off. This may all sound rather fanciful. Talk about the power of the people, when politicians' power and the machinery of spin is so seemingly unbeatable. This may all sound rather aspirational, and the controls on media are so stringent. But never forget, we vote politicians in and out, and in some countries, we throw politicians in and out. And as consumers, we are the source of media companies' clicks and currency. Let me finish with an example that demonstrates to me the power that people hold. In 2013, Egypt imprisoned three of my former Al Jazeera English colleagues on trumped up, made up charges. The outrageous lie was that they were supporting a terrorist organization. They were locked up to silence their brilliant journalism, to try to stop stories that were true, that showed a side of, a side of a story in Egypt that Egypt didn't want to be seen. They suffered under Egypt's persecution for an absurd amount of time, because of their great journalism. Other journalistic institutions, media organizations, stood up for the three, including our competitors at the BBC and ITN, The Guardian and The New York Times. They stood up for the three. But what really resonated and impacted the campaign to free them 
with the massive numbers of people who joined the Free AJ staff campaign on social media, in gatherings to make their voices heard, in direct communication with their governments. I think the figure was 1.2 billion, billion impressions on social media of the Free AJ staff hashtag. Millions of people were involved. People who cared about Bahar and Peter and Mohammed, but fundamentally who cared about their rights to be heard and to be informed. That collective voice, the power of real people, it made a huge difference. It let politicians know that they cared. It made politicians think twice before turning a blind eye to an outrageous injustice. And it made them think twice before enabling the expiry of a fundamental freedom for their people to have the right to be informed. The voice of the people had an impact then, and that voice needs to get louder. So let's not let politicians and countries and corporations and powerful individuals silence good journalism. Let's not let bad media hijack the reason the rest of the media exists. And let's hold all media, all media, to account for their actions. Let's call them on their commitment, their resolve, and their integrity. And if they don't, they no longer deserve the label journalist. That gold standard must be unflinching in its application. No, you have a right to be informed. Protect that precious freedom. Those caught up in stories, those persecuted by governments, those in the shadows because the powerful don't want a, shot, a, a spotlight shone on them, it's our responsibility to ensure a light is shone into those dark corners. To protect our own freedoms and to protect their rights to be heard. So the time has come to stand up for those rights and for journalists to play their part so together, we can strive to achieve information with integrity for future generations. Thank you.